Guest in this first segment is Senator Patricia Rucker. She joins us from the Capitol. Uh, Senator Rucker, good morning. Thank you for being with us. Good morning. Of course, it's always a pleasure. Good to hear all of you. What is the coldest it ever got in Venezuela when you were there? <laughs> like 70 degrees. Oh. <laughs> oh, you said that like you wanted to rub it in a little bit, too. Did you need, <laughs> did you need a jacket is the question, like a light coat when it gets to that temperature? Or? Yes, and actually to this day, if it goes below 60, I'm cold. So <laughs> this has been torture for me. Yeah, I can imagine. This is when we were like at uh, 2 the other morning when, when I came in here. Uh, Senator Rucker, so I guess you folks are uh, getting into the swing of things down there as, as you've been uh, active now for almost uh, two weeks since the governor's state of the state. Uh, what sort of things are you working on personally that you hope become uh, major pieces of legislation this year? Well, I have to tell you, yes, we're definitely in the thick of it already. Uh, I know that the Senate has already passed 34 bills we've sent over to the House, and we have a very full schedule today. Um, I don't know, maybe like 12 more bills on third reading. But um, we, we have a lot of things that, of course, we've tried to pass in the past. We're passing it again. We're hoping this time it makes it through. Um, most people don't understand that there's a lot of ways and a lot of bills that die, and it's only a few that actually make it through the entire process. But some of the ones that um, I've been trying to pass before in the past, and it didn't make it through, and we're trying again this year, um, we have a human smuggling bill that was um, a request of our police officers there in the Eastern Panhandle. It, it, it was, it is illegal, of course, to do human trafficking, but what is not illegal is to smuggle human beings. So when police catch uh, folks that are being smuggled, they can't really put someone in jail for that. So we wanted to make certain that, you know, that's not okay, that we don't just let those folks go who are smuggling these human beings, you know, very often in inappropriate and unsafe conditions. Um, there's also the West Virginia Guardian program, which once again, I'm a co-sponsor of, that allows retired police um, officers and military officers to be able to volunteer at the schools, uh, to provide security and really mentorship. Like our vision of it is, you know, these would be an additional trusted adult in the schools that, you know, can the kids can befriend and can, you know, go to if they need help. And more importantly, someone that's there just making certain things are secure and safe. And um, hoping this time it makes it through. Um, once again, trying today is on third reading my Glucagon for Schools Act, which would um, allow glucagon, uh, which are it's something that people that have a diabetes need if they're having one of their um, attacks where their blood sugar has dropped dangerously low. And this is a pen that you can train anyone to give. You don't need to be a nurse, although obviously if the nurse is there, she would be doing it. But in some schools in West Virginia, there is not always a nurse 24, well, I shouldn't say 24 seven, but when, when the schools are open, some nurses actually are part-time and are not there all the time. So we just want to make certain there's something to help those kids as an option um, because they can die from that. Um, also trying to create an adult education task force. Again, second year I have passed this. Um, I discovered through our Jefferson County adult education uh, folks they don't have steady funding. They have discretionary funding. So they have funding that is given to them by all sorts of sources, but none of it is steady. None of it is regular. None of it is, you know, like in a budget that they can count on. And so every single year they, they have to make decisions based on what we have right now. And to me, that's not a way you run a good, successful program, although they're doing incredible work. So I wanted to have a discussion a task force to have a discussion on what we can do to ensure that they have the funding they need to do the incredible work they do, which is to help young adults and adults of all ages um, get their GED, get work skills, um, be able to enter the workforce and really improve their ability to provide for themselves. And they just do amazing work. Um, do you want me to keep going? <laughs> Yeah, uh, please. If you, I mean, uh, just obviously your major ones that you're hoping get passed. Go right ahead. Okay. Well, I could tell you 
uh, Senate Bill 144 that uh, would make that all school board meetings open to the public, which um, you would think would happen, but unfortunately it doesn't always. So if they have any change of venue, um, they do not necessarily have to notify the public with enough notice for them to be there. So this is just clarifying that they really do have to provide you, that. You said that's SB 144? 144. 144. Now that's not listed under your sponsored legislation uh, docket. Is that relatively new? Uh, no, it got introduced. A long time ago, so I'm not certain why you're not seeing it. I definitely did introduce it. Well, I should say I'm a co-sponsor. So are you looking at lead sponsors, Bill? Yes. Okay, the lead sponsor of that bill is Senator Roland Roberts. Gotcha. Okay, that would explain that. Go ahead, Bill. I'm curious. I thought with the Open Meetings Act that all government meetings were open to the public, had to be advertised, uh, the agenda had to be published. Uh, why has that not been done? That's in that's in violation of the Open Meetings Act. Yes, I would say the same too. But unfortunately, there's just enough um, leeway in the language that, you know, like I said, if you have a change of venue, if, if you know, you decide, you know what, we're, we are going to have an issue in, in the place we usually meet, so we're going to change it to someplace else. Um, unfortunately, there are some school boards that do not feel that it is important enough to notify the public in time for them to be there. Again, I, I don't want to hit, uh, whip the horse too much, but that's yeah. all of that is spell, spelled out of the Open Meeting Act. If there's a change of venue, you have to advertise three days ahead of time. Uh, so uh, if they're not doing that, they're in just strict violation. Well, I will tell you that it's happening. Okay, so fair enough. Make certain that it doesn't continue. <laughs> All right, go ahead, uh, Patricia. If you wanted, if you had another bill you wanted to highlight, sure. Um, there's the Senate Bill 315, which I am a lead sponsor of, exempting ad valorem tax for houses of worship. Uh -huh. So um, there is a little bit of, um, again, lack of clarity. So we already have certain churches and certain. Um, institutions, uh, religious institutions that are exempt, but not all of them. And there is some confusion with the tax department if it's a multi-use facility. And so this bill actually provides clarity and makes the definition of when it is um, exempt and, you know, when it is not. So that one actually was, again, a request from folks in the eastern panhandle there are quite a few places that they do have multiple use and because of it have this confusion all right bill go right ahead yeah uh senate bill 280 the one that deals yeah. with uh, uh uh superior intelligence uh where is that now that deals with various intelligence no no superior intelligence or higher intelligence the uh uh intelligence design yeah intelligence design sorry sorry you're right oh it's okay no problem okay. um so i i believe that we passed that from the senate it was on third reading i believe geez i'm having trouble remembering it's not terrible so early but anyways um so i, I know it passed education last week um as you know i'm no longer in the education committee but um anyways i i know that it had it, it definitely had a lot of support so you think it's perhaps past the Senate and is on the way to the House, or we'll be going to the House? Yes, I believe so. Mm -hmm. I can look it up if you want okay. real quick. Well, I'd be curious. That's, that's received quite a bit of uh, publicity or visibility uh, throughout oh, the state. It's, yeah. on, it's on third reading today. Okay. It's on third reading. Yes, okay. no. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not a co-sponsor of that legislation, but um, my understanding is the committee amended the bill to, it doesn't any longer have the word intelligent design in it, but people are calling it that because mm -hmm. that's how it originally started out. But what it does is allow for the teaching of all scientific theories when it comes to um, how the world was made. Yeah, now, uh, I guess this is where one of the questions of, of debate is uh, uh, intelligent design that's more of a faith base as it is science based. Yes, that one in particular, but I will tell you that there are um, lots of different theories regarding how the world was made, and the language 
did get changed to not include intelligent design anymore. It just allows for all scientific theories. Sign, scientific theories, okay. Yeah. Matt Miller. I, I listen to these legislative sessions each year, and I hear you talking of 34 bills passed, 12 more on third reading today, and uh, earlier Bill bringing up the, uh, the the Open Meetings Act, and yet we need to have another law for, for school boards that apparently are already bypassing that, but it seems like there's a law already in place. The, the legislature meets every year, and bill upon bill upon bill gets passed. Is there ever a time when we, we have enough laws <laughs> or too many laws? Uh, yeah, I would say so. Um, so I, so much of what we do, really, um, one would think you would not have to. Um, I would much rather be working on repealing legislation that no longer pertains, um, updating language maybe. Uh, there are plenty of things that people don't even realize is already in state law. But like, so for example, the Glucagon for Schools Act, nothing is prohibiting the schools from having this um, life-saving um, medication. But the schools want protection, liability protection, so that if they have it and they give it to a student, they're not going to get sued. So we have to pass a law to give them the language so that they feel safe in being able to provide this. And to me, I feel like, okay, if it's something that might save somebody's life, you are already protected by our good Samaritan law that, you know, you were trying to save someone's life and you were not trying to hurt them, you're protected. But it just makes um, folks feel safe to know that we are telling them, yes, it's okay for you to do this. And then every single law that we pass will make rules and they will make rules to give you the step-by-step. -step. If you're going to provide this, this is what you have to do to make certain that you're doing it correctly. And it is a lot of that um, that we do. And I, again, I don't know what to tell you other than that folks want this. Um, citizens want this. Almost all of these legislation I was talking about this morning already comes from someone who has requested that we submit it like the human smuggling. Um, um, there, I just don't even know what to tell you. Uh, bills to create appeal processes. Um, so someone who's having difficulty with a state agency wanting to have the right to appeal the decision. And what, what are the conditions of that? How long do they have? Where do they go? Who gets to hear it? All of these things just adds to the volume of law that we have. But I will say, for the person that that impacts, it matters to them. Senator Patricia Rucker, our guest here on the program, she is the chair of school choice. What is the next level of school choice in West Virginia in terms of the development of these options, Patricia? Well, um, I'm glad that you brought it up because this week is National School Choice Week, um, as it so happens. And yes, so when it comes to school choice, so West Virginia obviously, you know, has a great education savings account. We now have charter schools. We have um, basically made ourselves open to all sorts of innovation of, uh, for education. So at this point, it's just a question of making certain the laws that we've passed have been implemented correctly and that there is uh, appropriate funding. And we also want to make certain that the things we are learning that are working in these school choice venues are things that we can hopefully encourage public schools to do. So, for example, if, if there's a uh, charter school that is having a lot of success with a flexible schedule, let's see if we can give our public schools a more flexible schedule and see if they can also benefit from that. Um, so... In the school choice realm will we'll continue to just be open to any opportunities to support families in whatever education they think is best for their kids. Speaking of school choice, in this past year, there was quite a stir created with student transfers to different schools, and it showed up in football scores. And as you know, Patricia, nothing gets people's attention like high school football in West Virginia. And yeah. as a result of that, there were some folks who began to complain 
to their delegates and delegates who and senators who said they would bring it to uh, a review in this next legislative session here, which is underway. Is there a movement to repeal or alter the transfer rules for high school students that kicked in last year? Well, I'm happy to say that we got a report of what the issues were from um, WVSSAC, and it's not um, really as bad as one would think. So I think there were definite some reports of um, – people who were taking advantage of the transfer system, which of course is human nature, but the WVSACC is aware and alert and where there was misconduct, they are on top of it. And I don't think there's going to be really any changes. It's, there really wasn't, thank goodness, um, what that serious or widespread a problem. Although, like you said, we know that there were some cases and they are on top of it. And I will tell you that if uh, an athletic coach, a uh, team coach, tries to recruit students in this state, the WVSSAC has the authority to suspend them from coaching. So is so that I really hope that, that that doesn't continue happening? Is that likely to be a consequence for some coaches in the state? I think that that may happen. Yes. Interesting. So the large scores were a product of administration over or administration breaking down as opposed to legislative problems. Exactly. And but we are definitely on top of it. We did have a meeting with them to discuss it. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. We've had those kind of large scores for a while, even before this particular bill was passed and and students were allowed to make those choices it was interesting though even uh you know being involved with fca we had a state meeting last august and it was in the southern part of the state and i had several of our fca representatives asking me hey what's going on in the eastern panhandle because they were talking about the number of student athletes in the southern part of the state especially uh, kanawha county that were transferring from one school to another within the county for an opportunity to play basketball basketball and or football. I didn't hear as much in some of the other sports, but uh, yeah, it's certainly an interesting uh, situation that developed from that legislation. Uh, Patricia, can I go back? Uh, tell me a little more about the Guardian program. Uh, I know that there's an effort in place in the legislature this year to try to get school resource officers in more and more schools. Is that a program that would kind of assist in that way that there may not, you know, if we can't get a school resource officer in a school, then we have a retired veteran police officer, someone who has knowledge and would be there to help provide safety. It, it, are they kind of working in conjunction, or, or would there be a different role for this Guardian program? So that's an excellent question. So I would say the, the efforts are in conjunction. They're both we're hoping to get through. So the school resource officer obviously is a paid position, there would be an additional staff, um, and the West Virginia Guardian, it's a volunteer. Uh, both, we are hoping, are going to get through the legislative um, session. I can tell you I support both. I, I know very few who do not want to see, you know, more happen to ensure the safety of our kids in our schools. And, I, um, again, any and all, any and all ideas uh, when it comes, we also – um, passed when I was the education chair two years ago, a school safety fund, and only last year did we put actual money in the school safety fund. And then this year, is they're going to actually start giving out the money to the schools. And um, so together, all three of those bills, I'm hoping, is going to greatly increase the safety of our kids in our public schools. What about the what are the qualifications of someone been in the Guardian program, Patricia? So. Um, it basically, you are a retired military or police officer with um, good records, and you will have to do a mandatory training to ensure that you know, you know the rules and the process um, for when issues come up in school. And then you would be allowed to be able to be at the school. Um, and I'm assuming, depending on how much, we, how many we get, how many volunteers, we're hoping that it is, you know. Five days a week, someone would be there, uh, basically patrolling the halls 
and being able to provide that extra eyes and ears. Um, and, you know, obviously we want someone who's never had a criminal background, so there will be criminal background checks that we do for anyone who is in our school buildings. Um, but um, that, that's basically it. And just like a school resource officer who is an officer of the law, these would be armed folks that would be in the schools that would be able to take care of any type of a situation that would develop? Yes, they would be. Is there any uh, definition of what we mean by armed? In other words, would it be concealed carry, or would they have a AR-15 strapped to the back? Uh, any discussion of that at all? <laughs> no discussion of an AR-15. Um, I, there is a definition, and I, I am, again, my understanding is already our retired police um, and military in the state of West Virginia are pretty much allowed to carry their firearms no matter what already. Like, they don't have to have concealed carry licenses or anything. We give them that respect because we know that they have been trained, that they have swore an oath. Um, and we, we allow that already in West Virginia, yes, this would allow them to also carry in a school. Patricia, final word is yours. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, I didn't get through all of my bills, but I will tell you that I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to talk to you guys um, anytime and always. Um, I continue to hear from my constituents. And listen, regarding what Matt said, yes, there are way way too many laws yes we do need to you know consider simplifying the laws in west virginia but at the end of the day like it's my job to try to ensure that my constituents are getting um their opportunity to protect themselves protect their property to have the freedom to be able to raise um their families and have a choice of what is best for them and that we, the state, are supportive of that. And uh, if you look at most of my legislation, it is in essentially doing that. I want folks to be safe. I want them to be um, protected. I want them to be healthy. And I really hope that we continue to keep doing the good work that's going to ensure that West Virginia is a great place to live. Oh, I, I'm sorry I missed something. And I know you've got to run into the Senate caucus here, too. But uh, your thoughts on the endorsement from Americans for Prosperity West Virginia branch? Well, obviously, I'm very pleased and honored to receive their endorsement. Thank you, Patricia. Have a great day. You too. Have a great day, guys. Thanks, Senator. Senator Patricia.